Let us pray. It's turning silent in this building. You called us to be here, and you brought us through your spirit to be together as your children. So as we approach you in prayer, we want to worship and praise your name, recognize you for who you are, and ask, O oh Lord, that as we continue to read your word, that you will speak to us through these words in a way that we can apply it to living in 2016 in a very complicated world. And Jesus, as we are going to look at the prayer that you yourself prayed, help me as your servant with stumbling word to be able to share some of what you were, try, what you were saying and praying for us in your name. Amen. So, uh, a while ago, I asked somebody, so tell me about your upcoming Thanksgiving plans. And I opened up a Pandora box. <laughs> because this person said, ah, all the family that's coming, it's making it very complicated. And then it's the food. And then the, all these personalities. And especially now after the election, to keep this lot apart can be quite interesting. Anxious, somewhat scared, somewhat concerned. And I said to this person, you know what you need is prayer. She said, oh, I need prayer. And that's what we need many times in our lives. When we are confused, concerned, scared, anxious, not really sure what we need to do, we want people to pray for us. And we will pray for ourselves also. And the most amazing thing is that when you actually then pray for someone, there's a connection between you, this person, and God. And I've had it a few times in my life where somebody would put his or her hand on my shoulder and pray for me. And there's almost this glow in your body to think somebody is praying for me. And this person now is saying things that are important to me and lifting this name up to God the Father. A connection. We find an amazing text now in John chapter 17. It's the last time that the Lord will be alone with his disciples before his crucifixion. He has said to them in, in a way all the things that they need to hear. This private time is over. He knows what lies ahead of him. And then we read in this text that the Lord stood there. He looked up and he prayed for them. But actually for us. Let's read. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. <clears throat> so now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. The first thing that the Lord prayed for is for him to be glorified with his Father. The word glorification or glorify in, in Greek actually means to lift up. It's to lift someone up. What the Lord is praying for is that you and I and, and his disciples will actually allow God to be lifted up in our lives. That he will actually be at the top of who we are and what we do and what we decide to do on a daily basis. He asks of his followers to realize that God is God. He asks of his disciples and his father to help us discover who God is. God is revealing himself in so many different ways to us on a daily basis, but we constantly miss him because we are so busy with all the other things that surround us. And sometimes we miss these amazing, amazing miracles of God. And time and time again, when we have our my story moment that people tell what has happened with them in their lives, you and I relate to those stories because we realize, but God was also involved in my life in this kind of way. God has also touched my life. 
glorifying God means that you and I, when we wake up in the morning, the first, first thing that you and I need to do is to think about God. When you drive to work and you think about your business day that lies ahead of you, we need to think about God. When you and I drive home and we do our business during the day, we need to think about God. The sad thing is that we many times leave God way at the end of our day. In the morning when I wake up, Lord, help me. In the evening, thanks, Lord, for helping me. In between, I'm in control. I'm doing my thing. Father, I pray, I pray that you and I be lifted up, glorified. I pray that you will, they will acknowledge who you are and who I am. I pray that they will worship me. I pray in you, and I pray that they will live for us by making our living Lord the centerpiece of our life. Tonight, you and I are going to turn on our TV, and there's probably going to be some breaking news. Hopefully, it's good news. Tomorrow morning, we will turn on our TVs, and there will be some early breaking news. I do not know what early breaking news is different from breaking news, but okay, it's breaking earlier than the other news. I do not know. Whatever. But they're trying to get your attention. Well, there's breaking news. And then it's a squirrel that's chasing people around in the senior living place. Uh, do not understand. Imagine. Imagine that the breaking news tonight on TV, 60 minutes will be that 12 people joined the church today in Orlando. The breaking news will be that thousands of people attended a worship service on Sunday and hundreds of people gave their lives to Christ. Isn't that supposed to be the breaking news every Monday morning or Sunday evening in our country? Because it's all about God. But what we have done is we have pushed God so far away and made it so about business and crisis and issues and what he said and she said and what's going to happen that we forget that God is working and God is on the move. And to glorify God means to lift his story up above all stories. Your story tomorrow when you go to work should be, I was in church yesterday to worship God. In my church, people decide to be a part of God's kingdom plan. I Believe in Christ Jesus. That's supposed to be your story, your breaking news tomorrow to the world where you go. Father, may they glorify. The second thing. Jesus thanks his Father for his disciples, for us. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me. They have kept your word. Thirteen times. Thirteen times in this prayer of our Lord, you will find the word gave or give. The Lord we believe in is a God that wants to give. Is a God that wants to be involved in our lives to build us up, to provide for us, to help us. He knew that his son needed his disciples around him when he was starting his ministry. The living Lord comes and he, asks, he, he thanks his father for his disciples. I can't read everything. It will take too long. But that's your homework. You need to read the whole chapter 17. This afternoon, not more tomorrow, today. And the Lord says, 11, he says, except one that decided to walk away from me. 11 you gave to me to be with me and to serve you and me. Do you know that in heaven, Jesus is thanking his father for you being in church today? His, his father gave us to him because we are also his followers. And we many times think in heaven they are busy with other stuff. God is creating a new planet somewhere and he says, Jesus, bring the plants. We need to do this thing so that the water is thick or whatever. I, I don't know. That's not what God is doing. What's happening in heaven or every moment of eternity until it all, well, it continues. But what, how, what happens in heaven is that God is busy with us, with his kingdom. The biggest plan that Jesus, God, and the, and, and the Holy Spirit is busy with today is actually for you and me to grow in our faith and to be what God wants us to do. And Jesus sits with his dad. He says, hey, thanks for that group that you gave me. Now, if you would turn around and look at the disciples, oh, no, they were not the best guys. They were not really looked like the 18. They were a little rough. And they were a bit, little bit you know, weird guys. You know, Thomas was still doubting. You know, Lord knew this guy would, ooh. And Peter always put his foot in it. You know, he was always sort of on the wrong side of the sentence. 
Well, we've got some of those now at church also, you know. Yeah. But the Lord used them all to change the world. I want you today to believe and know there's a prayer for you and me in heaven today. A prayer of thanksgiving because you are here. You are part of God's kingdom and God's work because you are a follower of Jesus. He prays that we be glorified. The glory that you have given me, I've given to them. The word glorified means to be lifted up. He prays that you and I be lifted up. What this literally means is he prays that you and I be lifted up above this world that can be so confusing, so painful, and that we will be in the arms of God. He prays that you and I will be recognized for who we are in the presence of God as the children of God. He prays that the angels will celebrate when we are doing what God has called us to do. He prays that you and I will understand how special we are. He prays for us to share the word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you, have, you gave to me, I have given to them. And they've received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. They didn't have any videos. They didn't have movie-making equipment. No cell phone that you quickly can take a selfie with Jesus. They only had words. God sent His Son to this world that we may know the heart of God. What Jesus did to what He said was God's plan for the world to understand who He is. So the only thing the disciples had when Jesus ascended into heaven was the words of Jesus and their faith in him. That's all they had. They had no proof for anything else except saying, I saw him. And this is what he told me. And I want you to know this is what he told me. That's why the word of our Lord Jesus Christ and what God shared with us is so important that we can't let go of it. That's why they will print Bibles constantly and Wycliffe down there. Are, are, are translating by the Bible at a rate that you don't want to know. They've translated the Bible into, into more languages in the last year than they trans translated the Bible in the previous 10 years. Because the world needs to know the words of God. Because it's God's plan for the world to know who He is. Because if the people do not hear the words of God, then the story of Christ goes away. My, my dad died in 2004. And I had the privilege to quickly, between all the hurricanes, to fly back home and be with him. He had four months after I heard that he was dying. And I sat with my dad, and I said, Dad, tell me those stories again. And he told me some of his stories when he was a child, and where they lived, and what they did, and, and his story. And I told some of those stories to my children, because that's the only way how his, his story will be able to continue, is by us sharing the stories. And a while ago, I sat with my mother. I said, Mom, tell me the story again of your childhood. And she told me this long story. And, and later on, I told my kids the story of her life. She's still alive. I can recheck that story again. The story of God's involvement in this world is in your and my hands. If we lose that story, the person goes away. The person is missing. God is missing from the lives of people. Father, you have given me the words. I've now given the words to them. I pray that they will use these words because it has to do with me and with you. That we will not be forgotten in the minds of the world. He prays for our protection. I've given them your word, and the word has hated, the world has hated them. Why does the world hate us? Because we are Christians. I am not asking you to take them out of the world. I ask you to protect them from that evil one. That's Satan. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. 
Normally, when you hear the word protection, you think to yourself, well, it, needs to put, it means to put stuff in a safe place. And the best, safe, safest place, I think, in America is Fort Knox. So I started to read about Fort Knox, and then I said, I shouldn't do this, because I don't want the FBI to show up. Why are you so interested in all the security measures we have at Fort Knox? So, okay, we already know that's really a safe place, but I can't tell you what they have because I didn't look anymore. I stopped when I read about all the concrete and the stuff. Okay. So, Lord, I believe in you. God, I want you to protect me. God, surround me with 14 layers of protection. Put me in a display case on, 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 on uh, a nice little velvet cloth that I can sit there free from the dust and any and any pain. That's where I would like to be, in your display case. Then I feel protected. This is the protection that Jesus is talking about. I sent them into this world, a world that hates them. Father, protect them. Protect them. I said this to a colleague of mine last week. I was at another pastor's conference type thingy, just for an hour or two. And we were talking about something, and I said to him, it's just to me the most weirdest thing. Wherever Christians go, they normally, normally bring good things. They, they pray for people, and they bring some, some calm, and, and they bring help, and they, and they are normally good workers, and they are honest, and they are people with integrity, because that's who we are supposed to be if we are followers of Jesus. And I said to this person, you know, uh, uh, they should hire you because you're a Christian above anyone else because they know there's a person with integrity. But the, the world does the opposite. They reject us. Why? They're afraid of us. They're afraid that if they connect with us, interact with us, they need to change. And what they do not know is the changes that Christ brings into somebody's life is not bad, it's good changes. It makes you better in your relationships, better with God, better with yourself, and you are a way more happier person. But oh no, I want to be in control of my life. I'm afraid that if I give too much of myself, I may lose my free will. That's nowhere to be found in my Bible. We are in a world that doesn't like us. I can't step back and say, I'm now a sheriff. I'm going to stay home. I need to do my job. How does the Lord ask us to be protected? I need to go back. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the word, I will, I sent them into the world. Sanctify them by your word. Our protection is the word of God. Our protection is to know what God wants us to do and what God wants us to say. Our protection is to know that God loves me and God will let, not let go of me. Our protection is when I'm in the deepest midst of, of a depression or a dark time in my life, I grab my Bible, I read it, I see God loves me. That's my protection. If I feel God has abandoned me, I open my word and see God will never let go of me. That's our protection. Second, last one. He prays for us to have eternal life with Him. Since you have given him authority over all, that's now himself, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus, whom you have sent. Eternal life is to be in the presence of God. Man, I can't wait. Eternal life is not this specific place. That people think, heaven, how is it going to look in heaven? Are the streets going to be paved with gold? And are we going to have these weird trees? And how, how are things going to be in heaven? I don't care. I'm going to be with God. That's all that matters. We're going to be with this amazing God who created and made everything. And Jesus says, I pray for them to receive this gift. To be with God forever. In fullness. Last one. He prays for us to be one, so they may be one as we are one in, in them, and you and me, they may become completely one, so the world may know that you have sent me, have loved them even as you have loved me. This means that you and I need to know that we are connected to one another. We are connected to Christ. We need to treat each other as if we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We are family. If you have an issue with someone, resolve it immediately. 
Do it biblically. Because the world needs to see that we are undivided. If you want to conquer, you divide. How can the church withstand the onslaught if we are divided in who we are? Now, luckily, by the grace of our Lord, this congregation is really a unit, a unit in many ways. But we always need to be careful. If, if I have a disagreement with someone, I can't just say, I'm done with you, and I leave. You harm the body of Christ. You need to go and figure it out with that person. Resolve it. Because we've got something that the world needs to see, and that's that we are different. That we resolve things differently. So that the world may know that you have sent me, have loved them, even as you have loved me. This is the heart of God for our country. That the breaking news will be that the people in America has found God again. The people in America has discovered the love of God. The people in America knows who God is and wants to worship God. Everything will be different in our country. Everything will be so fine. But how can our country know except by us telling and sharing? Somebody told me today that she was at a Y and she invited someone to our church and this person didn't come but at least listened to a sermon. I hope it was okay. The sermon, I mean. But at least this person is showing some interest. 89% of people that actually come to church for the first time or to a congregation for the first time come because somebody invites them. This month and December is our invitation month. It's Christmas. It's Thanksgiving. You've got the biggest excuse ever to say to someone, hey, do you have a church that you belong to? Or do you ever want to come to church? Just come to ours. It's a bit crazy, Pastor, but please come. You will understand him after one and a half years, but just hang in there. <laughs> For some, it's 10 years. They still struggle to understand me. But come. Because this is God's plan. For us to be his family. And Jesus prays for your joy. Jesus prays for your salvation. And Jesus thanks his Father for you and for me. Live like people that is owned, loved, and prayed for by God himself. Amen.